Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Pulp Crazy. I'm your host, Jason Aiken. After taking a bit of a break to recharge my batteries, Pulp Crazy has returned with a new episode devoted to Fritz Leiber's Fawford and the Grey Mouser. I'll be discussing the fourth book in the series, Swords Against Wizardry. This is a collection of short fiction of varying length. ISFDB categorizes Stardock and the Lords of Quirabal as novellas, with In the Witch's Tent and The Two Best Thieves in Lankmar as short stories. Like all of the Fawford and Grey Mouser tales, I listen to these via Audible, and I highly recommend the Audible audiobook editions, narrated by Jonathan Davis, with introductions by Neil Gaiman, and music by Michael Whalen. All of the tales in this collection were written by Fritz Leiber, with Harry Otto Fisher credited as co-author on The Lords of Quermall according to ISFDB. For those interested in learning more about Harry Otto Fisher's involvement in the creation of Fawford and the Grey Mouser, I highly recommend reading Liber's essay, Fawford and Me, which I'll link to in the show notes. Thanks to Deuce Richardson of the Swords of Robert E. Howard Forum for providing the link. The first story in this collection... In the Witch's Tent, first appeared in the Swords Against Wizardry collection back in 1968. It ultimately serves as a prelude or prologue to Stardock. Fawford and the Grey Mouser visit a witch's tent in the large town of Illich Ving, which is technically the smallest city in the land of the eight cities. They seek a reading from an old hag in regards to a quest they are about to undertake, thanks to a piece of ramskin parchment they found on one of their earlier journeys. The hag goes into a trance-like state and tells the duo, For reasons sorceress and dim, you travel toward the world's frost rim. You north, north, north and north must go, through dagger ice and powder snow, and many a rival, envy-eyed, will dog your steps until you've died. But after peril's cleansing fire, you'll meet at last your heart's desire, and then you'll find. But the witch is interrupted when a group of men who were after Fawford in the Mouser attack. In response, Fawford grasps the central pole of the witch's tent and withdraws it from the ground. From here, he uses the whole tent as a shield of sorts, and the Mouser tells him which way to go down the narrow alley as they escape. They leave the witch, who had thrown herself wisely to the ground behind. When they come to a soft patch of dirt, Fawford drives the stake down into it, and the pair exit the tent, leaving their attackers to assault the empty tent. The pair then decide to return to their hidden camp outside of the city. Fawford believes he recognized the voice of one of the attackers, a man named Narfi who has an aversion to bear meat. This wasn't a bad short piece for what it was. It served its purpose for setting the stage for Stardock. And if this was a reader's first time reading Fawford and the Grey Mouser, it introduced them to the characters. The bit of business with Fawford and the tent was amusing in and of itself as well. Stardock was first published in the September 1965 issue of Fantastic, which was a Digest magazine. It was nominated for the 1966 Hugo Award for Short Fiction, 
This novella picks up weeks later with Fawford and the Grey Mouser in the Cold Waste, which, if you recall, is the northern land where Fawford hails from. The reader is clued in on what's written on the ramskin parchment. Who mounts White Stardock, the Moon Tree, past worm and gnome and unseen bars, will win the key to luxury, the heart of light, a pouch of stars. Fawford comments on a local legend that the gods once dwelt and had their smithies on Stardock, and they launched diamonds, rubies, and other great gems there as pilot models for the stars. Once the gods made the stars, they threw the gems carelessly away across the world. Now, Stardock is a tall mountain in the cold waste. I've seen it referred to as the Mount Everest of Newan. Fawford and the Mouser planned to climb the adjacent mountain, Obelisk Polaris, which Fawford deems a far safer climb. Then they planned to cross over to Stardock. However, the two notice other climbers are about, no doubt, seeking the pouch of stars or jewels for themselves. The duo not only have these adversaries to contend with, but also some invisible beings as well. This includes two of the seductive variety. I enjoyed Stardock a good bit, but it was a little long for my taste. I thought Liber did a good job bringing in the science fiction elements into this sword and sorcery tale, though. Not to mention the twist regarding the true purpose behind the ramskin parchment, which was pretty creative. The invisible folk introduced in this story will come into play again during the fifth collection, Swords and Ice Magic. The Two Best Thieves in Lankmar was first published in the August 1968 issue of Fantastic, which again was a Digest magazine. This is one of those stories where Fawford and the Grey Mouse are part ways, and it's set shortly after their return from Stardock. They attempt to sell the unique loot they obtained during their journey to two different fences, the Mouser attempts to sell his share to Ogo the Blind, while Fawford attempts to sell his to Nemia of the Dusk. It's a fairly solid story, and as you can guess from the title, it's set in the city of Lankmar. It's always cool to see Fawford and the Mouser in their adopted home city, especially after they've just been out in the wilderness or on an adventure. Although the two have split up, they still run into each other throughout the course of the story and share scenes, but they're no longer considered partners. Unknown to each other, the conclusion of this story sets the pair off toward the same location, the subterranean mountain realm of Quermal, which is ruled over by Lord Quermal, a powerful wizard. Each of them will be serving as a sellsword or mercenary in the employ of a different son of Quermal. The Grey Mouser is employed by Prince Gwei, the younger son and ruler of the lower levels of the subterranean realm. Fawford is employed by Prince Hasjarl, the elder son and ruler of the upper levels of Quermal. It should be noted that Joanna Russ's heroine, Alex, makes a cameo during the closing scene of The Two Best Thieves in Langmar, shaking her head disapprovingly at Fawford's decision. The Lords of Quermal was first published in the January 1964 issue of Fantastic Stories of Imagination, which was a digest magazine. It is credited to both Fritz Leiber and his friend 
Harry Otto Fisher. I found The Lords of Quermall to be one of the better novella-length stories in the series, and it's the primary reason why the title of this particular collection is Swords Against Wizardry. This is a sort of palace intrigue type story, but with sorcery. As Quermall is a city or subterranean realm, populated by various sorcerers, including the royal family. Fawford and the Grey Mouser and their two new female companions, Friska and Evavis respectively, naturally become caught up in all of this. And speaking of their female companions, as of this episode, I've finished reading, or listening to, rather, all of the Fawford and Grey Mouser cycle. And let me suggest that you keep a running tally of all of the pair's romantic interests as you progress through the series, as this will come into play later on in the series. In my opinion, Swords Against Wizardry is a really solid collection of sword and sorcery tales. I look back on the first three collections as being a little bit more enjoyable overall, but that's most likely due to my personal preference of reading sword and sorcery tales in short story format over novellas. Despite this, the high quality of Stardock and the Lords of Quermall novellas allowed me to still enjoy this collection a great deal, and I think pulp sword and sorcery fans will as well. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Pulp Crazy. Pulp Crazy is located at pulpcrazy.com. I'm at Pulp Crazy on Twitter and Instagram, as well as facebook.com slash pulpcrazy. My YouTube channel is located at youtube.com slash pulpcrazy. I can be reached by email at pulpcrazy at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.